The season finale of The Last of Us started with these really prominent daydreams from Ellie having experienced an incredibly uh, traumatic incident in the episode prior. Ellie. Hmm? And I asked you this question. I've been really surprised about how much I've loved this series. It's so not my usual thing. Kind of sad that it's finishing, at least for now. Before we start though, a question for the comments below. What do you think is actually happening in our brain when we daydream? And at what point do you think that daydreaming starts to become a problem? This video, I'm gonna answer it. Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Dr. Elliot Carthy. I am a psychiatrist in the UK and on my channel, I do videos about mental health, mental illness, LGBT health. If you like that sort of thing, do check out the other videos. Do consider subscribing, liking, sharing, all those usual bits and bobs. Otherwise, on this video, I'm gonna answer that question. This is all about daydreaming and when it starts to become problematic. People's minds have a tendency to go a wandering, whether we're doing something requiring incredible amounts of focus or something really boring and mundane. It's a long recognized phenomenon. Freud even wrote about it in The Interpretation of Dreams. And while some have tried to separate mind wandering and daydreaming into separate though overlapping concepts, daydreaming having more purpose and more agency, mind wandering being more passive and completely unrelated to the task at hand, most of the time the terms are used interchangeably. Studies, albeit with variable reliability, have reported that people spend 30 to 50% of their time awake with their mind wandering, and the increased distractibility was actually associated with greater reports of unhappiness. The neuroscience of daydreaming is attributed to a set of structures called the default mode network. These interconnected structures throughout the brain, thought to control daydreaming, autobiographical memory, and conceptualizing the future. It's activated when we're not focusing on the task at hand, and instead our attention is directed inwards, onto an internal train of thought that's unrelated to external stimuli. It's then deactivated by deliberate thought, or if something external grabs our attention. Someone shouting your name over and over and over and over until it's loud enough to finally get our attention. It takes a few goes though. As the name suggests, the default mode network is our default setting. So if nothing is grasping our attention, the default mode network reigns supreme and our mind goes wandering. This is not the same as purposefully fantasizing about something where we have some control over the narrative. This is not the same as dissociation, this unconscious defense mechanism where our mind and our body kind of separate from one another. And of course, it's not the same as actual dreaming. But the term maladaptive daydreaming has started to creep into use in the mental health world. First, it's not a recognized mental disorder. Secondly, what makes it maladaptive is that it becomes conscious, purposeful, habit, compulsive, where you separate yourself off to somewhere more isolated so that you can facilitate this train of thought with some control over the narrative, but ultimately in a way that then impairs our function. If you ask me, this term maladaptive daydreaming is a potential symptom of an underlying disorder, but is not a disorder in and of itself. However, these are four mental disorders associated with potentially problematic or maladaptive forms of daydreaming. Number one, ADHD. Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is unsurprisingly associated with a lot of daydreaming. For some people with the more inattentive type, it's very difficult for anything external to grasp our attention. We're not very good at engaging our executive function from our prefrontal cortex at all. So if we're not directing our attention to something external, that default mode network remains active and our attention goes inwards towards that internal train of thought. For those with the hyperactive impulsive type, the problem can be difficulty sustaining attention. So while we may be able to activate our prefrontal cortex to something external, we struggle to sustain it and that's where our mind can start wandering again. Two, Two, anxiety disorders. Everything speeds up in anxiety. We're operating on adrenaline and while that can make us hypervigilant, so this sense of constantly being on edge, threats externally can grasp our attention, but so can anxious thoughts. So all of a sudden that internal monologue and that internal train of thought grasps our attention through the default mode network and often ends up making our anxiety even worse. Once anxiety ridden daydreaming starts, it's difficult to stop. Three, depression. Mind wandering or daydreaming can be an escape when the world and life just feels very, very hopeless and we feel very bad about ourselves with low self-esteem and this sense of worthlessness as well as hopelessness about now, ourselves and the future. Plus, our concentration gets worse in depression. Attention is directing our focus to a stimulus. Concentration is then sustaining it. So without concentration, the default mode network comes back into play. 
And much like anxiety, that internal train of thought in depression is often mood congruent. It's often in keeping with our mood. It can then reinforce a pattern of rumination about the negative cognitions that are themselves a symptom of depression. So while it may start as an escape, mind wandering or daydreaming might well reinforce and worsen depression as an illness. A target for cognitive behavioral therapy as a treatment. And number four is trauma. Trauma can lead to daydreaming and rumination about these past negative experiences often related to the trauma that can then be a precipitant for that hypervigilance, that sense of being constantly on edge that then triggers more of that re-experiencing, triggers more uh, impairments in our sleep, more nightmares, more flashbacks and greater generalized anxiety. And once again, we can see how there's a slippery slope between daydreaming potentially as an escape and how this unhelpful internal train of thought can worsen our mental state worsen our distress and worsen our day-to-day -day function. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below and if there's any other concepts you want me to do explanations of on this channel, let me know. I will check. Otherwise, I'll see you soon for another video. Love you, bye.